This conference will now be recorded. Thank you, Reverend. Uh, we're going to be in 1 John today, um, and this lesson today is an absolutely critical lesson. Uh, it is one of the most important lessons in our study because it helps us learn how to identify false teachers from those who teach truth. I just witnessed uh, some brothers and sisters that I know uh, experience the disappointment of finding out that someone that they thought was part of what we would call the orthodox Christian community, meaning that they believe that the scriptures are the word of God. Uh, they believe in the authority of scripture. And a person that was in their group was uh, uh, pretending to go along with their beliefs in order to sway people into a false belief. And so this uh, test, these tests that we will learn about, and there are going to be three of them, um, are important for us to know truth from that which is false. So we're going to pray and then we'll get into our, our lesson today. Father in heaven, as we come today, we thank you for your goodness and your grace. We pray, God, that in our study of 1 John, that we would be keen to understand your will and your word. Uh, we thank you in Jesus' name, asking God that your spirit would keep our minds straight and our hearts right so that the message of Christ is always clear for us and his love is always demonstrated by us. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, I want to uh, begin today with a statement. Ooh, 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 hold on a second, Waddles. All right, with a statement uh, that that I think will help us, and that is that our behavior reflects our belief. Our behavior reflects our belief. Um, sometimes we act as if people's uh um behavior can be excused but it is really our behavior that reflects our belief and what we believe about jesus and what we believe about god's word ought to be reflected in our behavior okay in fact most people will believe what we say uh, will believe what we do more so than what we say. Uh, you can preach a good sermon and teach a good lesson, but most people will believe what we do more than what we say. But it is what we say that reveals what we believe. And so we'll, we'll get into that. Listen, next week, oh, and I thought I had corrected that, but I guess I didn't. Uh, next week, we will be in revival. Next week, we will be in revival. And uh, there it is. OK. Um, Y'all see me making changes here on the fly. Next week, we'll be in revival. And uh, we will not have Bible study because we are in revival. So we'll be in our virtual revival next week. We're encouraging everybody to participate. It will be at 7 o'clock p.m. nightly. Um, we're asking every member of Second to give $25 toward the revival. And uh, it will be broadcast on our YouTube channel and our Facebook channel. And uh, all you have to do is enjoy the worship and the word. And so we want to thank our media ministry and our, and our team, SBC, our staff, we're working hard to pull this together. We are grateful that Dr. Jarvis Hansen has agreed uh, to do our virtual revival, and he and his team are working hard on their end to help us pull it together. All right, let's get into our scripture. Today's scripture is 1 John chapter 3, verse 24 through uh, verse chapter 4, verse 16, okay? Uh, 1 John chapter 3, beginning at verse 24 through chapter 4, verse 16, okay? And I don't normally highlight 
scripture, but I did that today for the purpose of our study. All right. Whoever keeps his commandment abides in God and God in him. By this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this, you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming. Excuse me. And now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world. Therefore, they speak from the world. The world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this, we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. And this, the love of God, was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this, we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit. We have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we know that we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. And whoever abides in love abides in God. And God abides in him. Amen. We'll stop right there for today. So let's get into our study a little bit. And uh, hold on a second. I think we have an online question. Let me get to this real quick. Uh, no, we don't. Um, so let's get into our uh, our text here. Okay. So what I'm going to do is do a little bit of a teach through uh, and talk about this, and then we'll get into our questions. Feel free to ask questions as we go along. OK, uh, by the way, this text is divided into some interesting sections. Chapter three, verse 24 is a summary of what has come before. OK, and then we have uh, uh, verses one through six, uh, which talks about the test of truth. OK, the, the difference between the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And then we have chapter seven, uh, ch verses one, seven through 12 which talks about uh, um, another test of truth, which is love, okay? Uh, that, that, that love demonstrates uh, that we are the children of God, okay? And then um, verses 13 through 16 talks about the fact of abiding in God. The proof of fellowship is our, the proof of our intimate relationship with God is our obedience to him. And I'm gonna rewind that and say it again. The proof of our intimate fellowship with God is our obedience to him, okay? All right, so let's get into this. Um, in verse 24, uh, John is arguing that, that, the, that being in intimate fellowship or abiding in Christ is demonstrated by keeping the Lord's commandments, okay? And that abiding in Christ equals being obedient to him, that obedience, obedience results in mutual abiding. God is in us and we are in him. And because we are in obedience to him, uh, his presence, his fellowship, his power, and his blessing 
occurs because he is within us, okay? Uh, the evidence uh, that God is in us is the, the demonstration or manifestation of his power and his influence in our lives, okay? And so to, to be in intimate fellowship with Christ is to keep his commandments. There are some people that act as if we can be in intimate fellowship with Christ and be in rebellion to his word. And that's not true. The, the, the evidence of intimate fellowship is really obedience to what the Lord has said, okay? Which is one of the reasons why we're here today, because if I know what he says, then I, and, and I've been empowered by his spirit to do it, then I can demonstrate that I am a child of God by how I live, not just by what I say. Okay, so so John makes the argument then that that we then have to test the spirit or the spirits, uh, the ones behind the speakers, those who are false teachers are influenced by another spirit. And the way that we know whether or not they're from God is whether or not that they confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Okay, the incarnational testimony of the church is that Jesus Christ was in the flesh. Um, 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 he came in the flesh. Those who do not believe that are false in their doctrine and in their teaching. Okay, the way that the, that the apostles taught the early church is considered to be what we call orthodoxy. It's right belief, okay? And so um, um, you will find that those who do not believe that Jesus is the Christ will not believe in the orthodox uh, belief of his incarnation. Now we're getting into some theological terms, so feel free to stop me and ask me questions at any time. Um, um, but there are people who will believe good things about Jesus, but, but, not, but not believe that he is God in the flesh, the son of God, okay? There was a question, go ahead. Okay, so I'm gonna give you two examples. The Jehovah Witnesses, do not believe that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, that he is the son of God. Neither do the Mormons, okay? What was the question? Go ahead. That, Go ahead. What was the question? Did someone ask a question? No, no, they did not. I'm sorry. I thought somebody asked a question. I'm so sorry. No, it's all right. I was just giving an example. Um, also, you will hear people from other faiths speak about Jesus as if they believe, but when you get down to it and you ask them, what do they believe? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is God? Do you believe that he is God the Son? Do you believe that he came in the flesh? Do you believe that he died for our sins and was buried, was resurrected on the third day bodily? Those are the questions that we ask in order to ascertain whether or not a person uh, believes the truth. Is it of God? And that's how we test whether or not uh, a speaker or a uh, person is a valid representative of Christ, okay? If a person dies in the incarnation of Jesus Christ, that he has come in the flesh, he has the spirit of the Antichrist. That is, he is, a, he is denying the doctrine of Christ uh, as, it, as it has been taught by the church. Is that Brother Alice? Yes. Um, yes. I'm wondering, does the, does the Trinity also fall into this test like when we when we ask people like do they believe in the trinity meaning that god is also you know the son and the holy spirit does that fall into this yes, test? It does. okay absolutely and as we walk through the text today you'll see that that john includes all three persons of the godhead in this discussion um and so um he starts with the father and the son and then right in a, in a couple of verses, here's the spirit of God as well. Look at verse two. By this, we know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. So there you have the Trinity right there in those 
verses. And so that is true. Uh, whether or not they believe in the in in the incarnation is true, but they also need to understand the person of the Godhead. Now, listen, when we, when we came to Christ in our Sunday school faith, we may not have understood all of that. But in order for a person to be saved, they have to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that his death on the cross satisfies uh, uh, the debt of sin that we owe. Okay? So is it of God? And so this is how we tell. Now, check this out. This is from Dr. Constable's notes. Notice that John did not say that we can tell false spirits by their works. Uh, it's not their works. He said that we can identify that they are false spirits by their message. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 1 through 5. It's not their works, it's their message. If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder that he tells you come to pass, and if he says, let us go after other gods which you have not known and let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams for the Lord your God is testing you to see whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and you shall serve him and hold fast to him. So check this out. It is possible, as we saw with Elimus, in the New Testament, Simon the sorcerer, it is possible for people who don't believe to do signs and wonders, but the message that they speak is how we validate whether or not they are false or true. So we need to be careful about being swept up into miraculous movements because the Lord, as we have taught, uses miracles to validate the message. If the message does not line up with the message of Christ, you can discount the miracle and the miracle worker. I'm gonna say that again. If the message does not line up with the message of Christ, does not line up with the truth of God's word, you can discount the miracle worker and uh, uh, the miracle. One of the things that we know about the Antichrist is that he will be a miracle worker, but his message will not line up with that of Christ, will not line up with the word of God, okay? And so we cannot be swept into uh, uh, being overwhelmed because somebody is able to do something that's fantastic, okay? You remember that when Moses threw down his rod and it turned into a snake, the Egyptian sorcerers threw down theirs, and theirs turned into snakes as well. So it is not the, 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 the working of miracle that makes the difference. It is whether or not what the person says agrees with the word of God, okay? Uh, I had a friend that used to go to these miracle working conferences back in the day, and I begged her to come to Bible study she wouldn't come to the church, but she would pay $45 to go to some stadium to watch a show, okay? What is the message, okay? The fruit of false prophets is their words, not their works, because Matthew chapter 12 says that they, uh, their, their fruits are their words. The Lord said that they are wolves in sheep's clothing, which means that they have the behavior, they have the right uh, uh, appearance, they have the right behavior, but their message is wrong, okay? Verse number 34, you brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. So you can tell what a person believes, not just by what they do, but also by what they say. What's the message that comes out of their mouth? Listen carefully, okay? 
Uh, I can put on a suit. I can have the right behavior. But what comes out of my mouth reveals what comes out of my heart. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard anybody say something in a joking way, but you knew they were serious? So you can tell what's in their heart by what comes out of their mouth. And so John warns us that the fruit of false prophets is what they say, okay? Um, he didn't say that every spirit that denies uh, Jesus, but every spirit that does not confess Jesus in verse three, because what heretical teaching will do is they won't directly contradict the truth, but they'll fail to affirm the truth. They won't say Jesus is not the Christ, but they won't say that he is. They won't say that Jesus is not God, but they won't say that he is God. They won't say that Jesus is not uh, the only way of salvation. Uh, and so they'll say things like, I believe in Jesus. And then you think that's a Christian brother or sister, but what do they believe about Jesus? So be careful because false teaching often will fail to affirm biblical truth, that Jesus is the Christ, that he is God, okay? Any questions so far? All right. So how do we overcome these false teachers? First John 4, 4 says, little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater he who than he who is in the world. The spirit of God that lives in us is stronger uh, than the devil himself, okay? And we have to learn how to resist the devil's temptations to doubt and to deny, to disregard, and to disobey the word of God. We live in a culture now that tempts us and almost demands that we disregard the word of God and that we disobey it and that we doubt it. If you go back to Genesis 3, that's exactly what the devil did. His game has not changed. It's just become more sophisticated. And so the, the, the denial of who God is, the denial of his word, disregarding it, pretending like it doesn't matter what the Lord says, that's part of our culture now, okay? But the spirit of God that lives in us, when we have informed ourselves with the word of God and we're in tune with God's will and his word through our obedience, his spirit, the Holy Spirit will guide us into uh, the way that we should go, okay? Because he is stronger than the enemy, okay? And so this is why, this is how we can tell the spirit of truth versus the spirit of error, okay? Does it line up with scripture? I'm just gonna make it plain. Does it line up with scripture, okay? Uh, they are from the world, therefore they speak from the world and the world listens to them. We are from God, whoever knows God listens to us. And when, when John uses the word us, he's talking about the apostles. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this, we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And so whether or not a person is willing to follow the revealed truth of God, which we believe is revealed to us in the canon of scripture, that shows us whether or not they are in error or not, okay? Um, 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 what does the Bible say, okay? And then we need an accurate system of interpretation so that we don't fall into error because of our own biases, okay? So the spirit of truth will agree with the word of God. Those who are true will agree with the word of God. Those who are in error will argue against it. And so the real test then, another true test of whether or not we are of God is whether or not we love. Because God is love and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. So, so, so it's not just a matter of being right or wrong. 
It's a matter of whether or not we love others, okay? Because if we love others, that's one of the characteristics of God, okay? So that's one of the tests of being of God. And as we said, there'll be three throughout uh, these passages. The proof that the Father loves us is that he sent the Son into the world. He sent Jesus Christ to be the propitiation. And we have taught that the word propitiation means the atoning sacrifice. Reverend Jones, I need you to go see who's at the door with Sister William. Uh, the atoning sacrifice, we need the atoning sacrifice of Christ is God's proof uh, that we, that, that he loves us, him sending Christ on our behalf, okay? He is the propitiation of, for our sins. That's the proof of the Father's love for us. Now, in John, uh, in 1 John, there are three stages of love, okay? Um, um, and loving others allows God to be in close fellowship with us. But the three stages of love are love manifested to the world, and then love given to the family of God, and then love perfect, perfected in a smaller group within uh, this family. God's love is progressive. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Okay. Um, then he has already told us that it does not appear what we shall be, but we know uh, that when we, when he appears, we will be like him. Okay. And so, and so the love of God does not reach perfection perfect love until it finds objects of love beyond itself, okay? Uh, and the visible manifestation of that love is how we treat other people. It's how we treat other people. <laughs> it's how we treat other people, okay? The demonstration of that love is how we treat other people, okay? Um, and the proof of our relationship with him. By this we know that we abide in him and him in us because he has given us his spirit. So the spirit of God dwelling in us is proof of our relationship with him. Okay. Sister Jenkins, did you have a question? All right. I'm glad to see you on here. Uh, um, and so the, the witness of the apostles, and we have seen and testified that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. That's what we mean about the, the apostolic witness, not apostolic as a denomination, but apostolic as in being those original uh, apostles' words that now have become the word of God. That is our witness. Uh, and that is that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. So how do we know as a result of that, if we, if our fellowship with the Lord is where it ought to be? Uh, and the proof is if we love one another, okay? Uh, um, um, God loving us is the model for us, but the manifestation is us loving others, okay? No brother or sister should be beyond our sacrificial love. Woo, that's a tall order, because pastor, you don't know how so-and-so acts. Well, doesn't matter. No brother or sister should be beyond our sacrificial love. If God can love us, knowing all he knows about us, certainly we can love one another. And we don't know everything about one another, okay? Uh, and so the proof of our maturing fellowship in verses 11 through 12 is if we love one another. Love reaches its full flower, its maturity, and thus demonstrating that we love 
one another, okay? So why verse 13 through 16 says, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit and we have seen and testified. The apostles saw Jesus himself. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the son of God, and this goes back to the beginning of the argument, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love and whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. So that's why we say our belief is reflected in our behavior. If you want to know if somebody really loves the Lord, watch how they treat people. Our belief is reflected in our behavior. Okay. All right. Any questions before we get into our discussion questions? All right, so let me ask you a question. Can a person uh, claim that they love God, but they can't stand so-and-so? No. 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 <laughs> no. Yeah. And can a person claim uh, that they love God, but they're not willing? to submit to his word. To loving no. God, yeah, means that I've got to be in tune with what he said. Now, immature believers often act like unbelievers. Immature believers often act like unbelievers. But as I mature in my relationship with the Lord, there ought to be some growth and some development that is seen in our behavior. Okay, our belief reflects, is reflected in our behavior. All right, let's get into our discussion questions then. We have quite a few of them today. So what is the evidence of intimate fellowship with God? What's the evidence of intimate fellowship with God? Our obedience to his commandments. Our obedience his to his commandments and his word, yes. Uh, how we behave is evidence of our intimate fellowship. If we are abiding in him, it ought to be shown. What is the test of knowing whether or not a spirit or speaker is of God in verses two through three? Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. But if not, they are not of God. All right. So does the person agree that Christ has come in the flesh? Sister Murphy, go ahead. I was just thinking, it came to me that saying about if you listen to a person long enough, he'll tell you exactly who he is and what he believes in. Yes, absolutely. Yes, and, and, and they'll not only tell you what they believe in and who they are, but they will also discover whether or not they're right because you can, you can line it up with the word of God. What is the test that demonstrates the spirit of falsehood or the spirit of God? Page 89 through 90. The test is what does a person believe what about the, Jesus? Yes. A false spirit, they, they are utterance or persons who are inspired by a spirit that is opposed to Christ and they produce a false teaching. All right. Somebody else is speaking as well. It's their message that matters. The message matters. Sister Taylor? Uh, well, I was going to say, um, if a person denies the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
All right, question number four, how can we tell if a spirit is false? By his message. By the message, not the behavior, not the wonders, not the signs, not the dress code. See, we have, we have this false idea of what it means to be in the faith. We have equated in our culture being in the faith with how a person dresses, how they look, how much money they have in the bank, whether or not they have good credit. Uh, all of those things we have equated with being uh, a moral people. But it is the message that matters more than the accoutrements of culture, okay? Uh, um, what is one of the ways that heretical teaching mask its deviation from the truth? They fail to affirm that he is Christ. So you can you can talk about Christ, but unless you affirm that Christ is the son of God and is God, then they're not speaking the truth. Yes, they fail to affirm that he is Christ and that God the Father has sent him. Okay, Brother Foley? Yes, I got a question. Uh, yes, you're talking, you, we were talking about the uh, following uh, a person that uh, doesn't uh, abide by the scriptures. Okay, uh, we have a lot of uh, different churches where we have uh, uh, ministers that uh, refer to themselves as apostles. Well, according to scripture, they can't be an apostle. Uh, is the rest of their message, would you follow this person? I'd be reluctant to. Some of that is just, let me just be blunt. Some of that is ignorance because they have not read what the test of an apostle is in Acts and in other scriptures. They also don't recognize that the apostolic age ended with the original apostles. Uh, that, that, that the reason that, that we have the scriptures now is because we have the word of God, which is connected to Christ. And so, um, um, we have to be careful about seeking. Um, I prefer to be referred to as pastor because that is what I do. Um, um, to call oneself an apostle, and I was in a discussion group earlier reading, uh, and this person was referring to themselves as the archbishop prelate, all of those things are man-made titles. Um, and, and we have to be careful about getting caught up in what I call ecclesiastical, uh, hierarchies, um, um, because the devil can use pride to cause us to lose sight of the goal of the gospel, which is for people to be saved and to walk in fellowship with Christ and one another. So I, 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 I wouldn't ascribe to that person can have an error in that area and still preach truth because they haven't understood uh, the office of an apostle. But I would be reluctant to embrace that at all. Okay. All what right, let's get to question six. No, go, go ahead, brother Jordan. Go ahead, Pastor, I'm sorry. No, no, come on. Man. Well, no, I was wondering, would, would it be all right to bring that to their attention and the apostles or when it talks about that in the Bible, but in a, a certain way, I guess? It would be if you have the right relationship with that individual. That's what I was going to say. If you have a relationship with them where you can explain it to them carefully and where they can see it and hear it, that's fine. But I wouldn't get into arguments with people about what they want to be called. Uh, I had one of the ugliest arguments in my life with a person in church because I was holding an office in the church and they kept calling me by my first name in front of a bunch of kids. 
and they were doing this to try to demean me. And I had to call them on it. And the brother got mad, started hollering and yelling and whatnot. But I had to, I had to help them understand we got to speak, we have to speak to one another in a respectful manner. And uh uh you know, our relationship was such that we were able to get through that. If you don't have a relationship, remember that there's no authority without relationship. If you don't have the relationship with the person, it's difficult to speak to them in an authoritative way. Okay. All right. According to verse four, how do we overcome these false prophets? By the spirit of Christ, which is within us. By the spirit of Christ, which is within us. And how do we know those who follow the spirit of truth versus those who follow the spirit of error? By their message. By their message, okay. Uh, how else do we know them? By comparing their uh, teaching with the scripture, what the scriptures teach. Yes, sir. Compare what they say to the Bible. I always go back to that old saying I learned in Sunday school, but what does the Bible say? Okay. Thank you, Deacon. Question eight, page 92 of Dr. Constable's notes. What is the way to distinguish truth from error on page 92? And we really just talked about it. What does the scripture teach? What does the Bible say? Okay. All right, question number nine. What is the test of whether or not a person is of God in verses seven through eight? Their love for others. Their love for others. Take note of these tests that we're referring to. You'll need them for the next lesson. <laughs> if somebody is, says that they are from God, they're of God, I'm a believer in Jesus, but the way that they treat other people is horrible, there's something wrong with their relationship with the Lord. Okay? Question number 10, and, and this is why in this political season, we have to be extremely careful about how we are treating people um, who may have different views than we do. Uh, um, because they have different views does not mean we don't treat them with love and respect. Um, so that's, uh, that's uh, uh, one of the things we have to be careful about, okay? All right. What is the proof of God's love for people? God sent his son to die for us. All right. He sent his son to die for us. And then we talked about the meaning of the term propitiation as it relates to that verses in those verses. What is propitiation mean in verses 10, verse 10. Atoning sacrifice. The atoning sacrifice. In fact, that's one of the reasons why I like the Christian standard Bible because it just goes ahead and translates it that way. Okay, the atoning sacrifice. What does it mean that Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for us? Bonus question. <laughs> his sacrificial death paid for our sins and bought us eternal life go on and take him his sacrificial death paid for our sins and brought us eternal life thank you dean smith it's important for us to explain that because saying atoning sacrifice does not make any sense to anybody who is not uh, in the faith. And so if we say it the way that Dean Smith said it, which is that this person, that Jesus's death pays for our sins and brings us salvation, that will make sense, okay? And lately I've really been on this drive to make sure that we clearly explain 
what we believe. What is the proof of maturing fellowship with God in verses 11 through 12? We love one another as God has loved us. If we love one another as God has loved us, absolutely. Uh, question 13, complete the following sentence for page 96 of Dr. Constable's notes. Since no one in blank blank is beyond the reach of somebody complete this for us. Since no one in all humanity is beyond the reach of our Savior's sacrificial death, no brother or sister should be beyond our sacrificial love. Yes. Say it one more time. Since no one in all humanity is beyond the reach of our Savior's sacrificial death, no brother or sister should be beyond our sacrificial love. Mm. Think about that. Since no one in all humanity is beyond the reach of the of the of the Savior's sacrificial love. Uh, beyond the reach of the Savior's sacrificial death. No brother or sister should be beyond our sacrificial love. How does that impact us as a Christian community? We should be about the great commandment to what is the great go out to go therefore into all the nations teaching and introducing them and sharing the good news of Christ so that knowing that yes. them, they have the opportunity to accept Christ and that none of them should be lost. Yes. If I love people, I ought to want them to be saved. But I also ought to love them in a way that makes the gospel attractive. One of the things that has driven people away from the church is our judgmental attitudes and all of our little petty rules that have nothing to do with the gospel. Now, I'm wearing a suit today, uh, but I really thought about coming up here today in some jeans and my Chuck Taylors and a sweater. Uh, the dress code does not really matter that much, but you know, that I, I put the suit on because uh, that's what I was comfortable in. And if I have to respond to an emergency, I don't have to change my clothes to make other people comfortable. So in a way, and I'm not holding myself up as some paragon of virtue, but in a way, the dress code is a sacrifice for other people. But, but it doesn't mean that it's a rule that other people have to follow, okay? Right. And so one Wait, thing sorry, Pastor. Go ahead. Sorry, Pastor. I misspoke. That was the Great Commission, but we should also be yes. about the Great Commandment to love one another. Yes, which is <laughs> yes. Well, that's why I re-explained it, but I didn't. I, I didn't say no. You're wrong. Um, but the Great Commandment is to love one another. The Great Commission is to bring other people to Christ. And Sister Hickman is right. Those dual things are the mission of the church, which is why we believe that our discipleship process is connection, commitment, and community. Connection is connecting people to Christ through worship, evangelism, outreach, and other uh, opportunities uh, to, to reach people. And then commitment is developing their gifts, skills, and abilities to the point where they are able uh, to, to work in a, a ministry, which is commitment. So, so we have to be careful that our love, the way we express ourselves, draws people to the Savior. All right, question 14. What are the three stages of love in 1 John? Love manifests uh, to the world. 
Lord, given to the family of God. Lord, perfected in a small group. All right. Love given to the world, love given to the family of God, and love perfected in a smaller setting, a smaller group setting. All right. Question 15. What is the proof of fellowship with God in verses 15 through 16? That we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. And whoever yes. abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Yes. So write this down. There are two things. The proof of fellowship with God in verses 15 through 16 is right belief and right behavior. Right belief. We have come to know and believe. And then right behavior, we love, okay? Those two go hand in hand. All right, any questions? Is the uh, beginning of that scripture that says, especially to those who are the household of faith. It says, let us do good to all men, but especially to those who are of the household of faith. Yes. And do you think that I goes with uh, love perfected in smaller groups? Yes, I think it is. But I think that when he's talking about that, he's talking about the family and the, the family church family and the family of God. He's talking about how we treat one another. Now, that's Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, which, by the way, we have to understand the context of that. <laughs> So I'd encourage you to go back and look at Galatians chapter six um, and see what the context of doing good is. All right, I will read that. All right, other questions? All right, so the, the, the proof that we love God is demonstrated in our belief in our obedience to his word and how we treat one another and how we respond to the world. Uh, our right belief is reflected in our behavior, okay? All right. This time we're gonna thank God for everybody in here who's joined us today and we're going to end our recording. We pray it's been a blessing.